So, it gives me great pleasure to give you a bit of background about Dr. Jeffrey Bennett before we invite him onto stage. Dr. Bennett received a bachelor's degree in biophysics from the University of California in San Diego before getting a PhD in astrophysics from uh, the University of Colorado. He then went on to research and education positions at Caltech JPL in Pasadena in California, and then also at the NASA headquarters in Washington, DC. He's also been an educator at the Challenger Center for Space Sciences, and for the past 15 years, he has been a prolific author of uh, an incredible number of books, including uh, The Cosmic Perspective, which is the introductory uh, astrophysics textbook that we use here at Florida Tech, and many other universities use that as well. Uh, he's also published a book called uh, On Teaching Science, and he gave us a quick lecture earlier, to, well, not a quick lecture, an hour, an hour long uh, delightful lecture earlier today on um, some of the teaching practices that we should all be using, both as uh, faculty, other students, and indeed parents. He had some good parenting tips as well, which uh, was interesting for me. Uh, <laughs> Um, he's also published um, many children's books, including the Max Goes to the X series. Max Goes to the Moon, to Mars, to Jupiter, to the International Space Station. And he has also written a book about the wizard that saved the world. Um, so uh, he's, he's got lots of these, these children's books. He has a new one coming out next month called I, called I Humanity. Uh, and some of us were lucky enough to have a flick through uh, that book earlier today. However, we are here this evening to talk about uh, Dr. Bennett's latest book, What is Relativity? So without further ado, if you could please join me in welcoming Dr. Jeffrey Bennett to the stage. Thank you very much. Okay. Thank you. So first, I'm going to make a comment about these chairs. Um, Dr. Jeff and I have been at this since about 9 o'clock this morning, so if we fall asleep, uh, we'll have to be woken up by rapturous applause, of course. Um, so, so thank you, Dr. Bennett, for coming. It's a, it's a pleasure to have you here, and um, I understand that you're actually on, on tour right now, essentially, is that? Well, I call it my relativity so you, I think you all know that this year is the 100th anniversary of Einstein's publication of his general theory of relativity. These are great chairs. <laughs> <laughs> and um, we're sinking into a blanket. <laughs> <laughs> and because it's that 100th anniversary, the United Nations actually designated this year officially as the International Year of Light, because light is very important in relativity, as we probably will talk about tonight. And so last fall, the group behind the International Year of Light sent out an email to uh, scientists around the world saying, if you could do something to help promote public understanding of relativity, please do. And I thought, well, I have a book, and I like to talk to people, so why don't I go places? So I just emailed people I knew around, and uh, this is one of the places that responded. And I've been to about 20, 30 cities, something like that, doing uh, talks on relativity. I was in New York on Monday. I was in San Antonio last Friday. I'll be in Nebraska next Friday, and I've got a handful more before the end of the year. Right, and then you've got an another tour coming up next year, right? Well, this has been so much fun for me to talk about relativity that I thought I can't keep doing it since the 100th anniversary will be over. I mean, I guess I could, but I should do something different so I don't get bored. So for next year, if you have me come back, I will be talking about global warming. A hot topic, right? <laughs> <laughs> and one that's very timely, yes. Right, just yes. like the hundredth anniversary. Well, hundredth we'll, anniversary. Of hopefully, we'll solve this one before the hundredth anniversary. <laughs> right. Yeah. So, um, one of the interesting things I find about discussing uh, relativity is that it highlights a lot of the common misconceptions that. Uh, that a lot of people have about some key areas of physics. And we saw uh, a demonstration of that earlier today when we were up at the Kennedy Space Center. So um, and this, this is to do with gravity as well. So um, let's, have a, let's have a quick discussion on, on misconceptions so that people can kind of um, frame their mind in the, the new way that they have to think about these types of things. Well, when, when you have a misconception, the way that you have to overcome it is by realizing that something about it isn't making sense. And it's actually very interesting if you look back at relativity because Einstein 
said that he got into this mode of thought because when he was a teenager, 15, 16 years old, he started to imagine what would it be like to ride on a beam of light. And when he thought about it, he started to encounter all these things that didn't seem to make sense based on the way we think about space and time and speed ordinarily. And those thoughts ultimately led him to at least the special theory of relativity. So you have to think deeply when you've got some idea and say, does it really make sense all the way down to the root? Some of the misconceptions we deal with, like the one this morning, are much easier to get to that root than others. Uh, should we tell them the, the I, Might as well. Yeah. Um, well, here, we can do an experiment. You're, you're probably too sophisticated an audience for this, but, but we'll try anyway. <laughs> you can shout out, why are the astronauts weightless on the space station? Oh, I told you you were too sophisticated for this. <laughs> but you know that when you ask a lot of people this, they'll say there's no gravity in space. But if you then follow and say, why does the moon orbit the Earth? Most people have heard that it's because of gravity. And when you put those two together right away like that, they'll realize, wait a minute, how can there be no gravity in space if gravity is making the moon orbit the Earth? So you get someone to address that misconception for themselves, realize there must be something wrong with what they're saying, and now they're ready to learn about free fall and what the real re reason you're weightless is. And in relativity, the misconceptions maybe are a little deeper since 99% of humanity has the wrong idea about what time and space are, minor detail. Um, <laughs> <laughs> Everyone got here on time. <laughs> yep, at low speed. And in the right place. <laughs> yeah. So, that, I mean, there are, there are plenty more um, misconceptions that we, that we all come across. And um, this, this one of um, space and time being two separate things is a, a particularly um, difficult one to overcome. Um, and, and one of the things I like to ask people is, have you ever managed to move through time without moving through space. And that's, that sets off a little, a little thought process there about what uh, relative motion is and, and, and all of these things. Um, so relativity itself is, I think, a, an excellent way to get people to stop and really think about what's going on. Because as soon as you, the word relativity itself produces a bit of a, I, there's no way I'm going to understand that. But your book highlights that there, there are plenty of ways that people can understand relativity. So, so what are some of the common analogies that are used uh, to describe, um, to describe, that you use to describe relativity? Well, you know, I think to start out with, I'll say in, uh, from your first comment there, yeah, relativity is, is this different idea of time, space, time, and gravity that we need to get our minds around. The reason that we have the misconceptions about space and time that we do is because we live our lives at low speed. And at low speed, our ordinary conceptions of space and time are perfectly reasonable for the conditions that we live in. The problem that a lot of people have is you want to assume that these low, and I should clarify what I mean by low speed. <laughs> by low speed, I mean speeds that are slow compared to the speed of light. So take, for example, the fastest thing that humans have ever built which would be the New Horizons spaceship that went past Pluto in July. It's going 50,000 kilometers per hour, which is, if you're a Superman fan, about 100 times as fast as a speeding bullet. And it's 1 20,000th of the speed of light. So when I say low speed, I mean even speeds like that, because in our ordinary lives, we're so far from the speed of light that you wouldn't expect to have any understanding of this. And I'm sorry to go a little off track here, but it reminds me of something I did want to do with all of you, which is to show you how your common sense and your intuition differ. People like to complain that relativity, these new ideas of time and space, violate common sense, but they don't. And there's a reason they don't violate common sense. And the reason they don't violate common sense is because when it comes to these ideas of relativity, you don't have any common sense. <laughs> and that's not an insult, it's just a fact. Common sense means sense from your common experiences, your everyday experiences. You've never traveled at the speeds where the effects of relativity become 
noticeable, so there's no way you could have any common sense about it. The problem is you have common sense for the low speeds at which you travel, and you want to think that they should apply to high speeds also, but they don't. So you have to get used to that idea and develop a different common sense to accommodate what relativity tells us. And the way you can do that, well, there's a, there's a lot of steps involved in getting there, but the way you can convince yourself that you're capable of it, getting back to that question of is this hard or not, and the answer is, well, everything that you want to learn takes some effort, but this is not particularly difficult. You've done this kind of thing before. So let's go back to our uh, participation here. Everybody point up. Good, everybody point down. Now that is common sense, and it's really good common sense. And if I brought a globe here, and I showed it to you, I might then follow up and say, well, how come the people in Australia aren't falling off? What's the answer? Well, the answer is that common sense you just gave me, that's fine for a small room like this. It works quite well in here. It explains why not to jump off the stage. You can play basketball with it. But it doesn't work for the whole planet. For the whole planet, you need a different common sense toward and away the center of the Earth for up and down. Back in first or second grade, you learned about that, and you de developed a different common sense for the whole planet than for the local environment. It's the same thing with relativity. You've got a common sense that's fine for low speeds, but you're going to need to build a different one to encompass all the speeds that there are, the higher speeds all the way up to the speed of light. So, uh, I mean, the speed of light is obviously a core component to um, the, the, the theories of relativity. So what, what was it that precipitated or what was it that provoked people to start thinking about why there is a, a, a fundamental limit to the speed of something in the, in the universe? I'm not sure, if, historically, I don't know the details enough to know if people were really thinking about it quite that way, other than Einstein, because he was concerned about that going, uh, what it would look like to be riding on a beam of light, but he, others did realize there was something strange going on with the speed of light. And since I know you're a sophisticated audience, a lot of you have probably heard of the laws of electricity and magnetism, Maxwell's equations. And Maxwell's equations have the speed of light in them, but there's a problem in there is it doesn't give you a reference frame for measuring what is the speed relative to. And it took until 1905 and Einstein to figure out the reason it didn't give you a reference frame was because you don't need one for light. The speed of light is always the same for everyone. And maybe that brings us to another misconception about relativity, which is understandable given the name of the theory, but most people think it's a theory about relativity. And it's not really. It really would have been better named the theory of the two absolutes. Because the only thing that's relative in relativity, that starting point, is the relativity of motion, which leads to some relativity of time and space. But if you read Einstein's original paper from 1905, he doesn't call it the theory of relativity. I don't even remember exactly where it got that name, but it came later. It wasn't something Einstein gave it. And in the paper, he says, you come to these conclusions based on number one and number two, and those are the two absolutes. And the first one is that the laws of nature are the same for everyone, and the second is that the speed of light is the same for everyone. And what Einstein realized was that the laws of nature being the same for everyone, people had generally assumed that would be true. And again, for those of you who are more sophisticated in here, more specifically, we're talking about that they should transform from one reference frame to another, and the laws should still be the same. But the laws of electricity and magnetism seemed to change when you transformed into a moving frame, which seemed to be violating that idea of the laws of nature being the same for everyone. Einstein showed you could reconcile those, you could make the laws of nature still be the same for everyone, if the speed of light was the same for everyone. So that is the real heart of relativity, is that the speed of light is an absolute that everyone will always measure the same no matter how you're moving relative to the light source, you'll get that same speed of light. Absolutely. And, uh, and so, Absolutely, uh, yeah. Think, yeah. <laughs> Theory of the absolutes. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Um, and so, it, I mean, in your book, you, you do a lot of uh, talking about Al in his spaceship and, and you in your spaceship. And so it's, it's worth reiterating that these, the, these things are going to be observed no matter what the observer is doing, right? So, That's right. And it's such a strange idea 
Let me explain to you why it's such a strange idea. You know, if I'm in an airplane moving by you at 500 miles per hour and I have a ball in my hand and you're in the plane with me and I toss it to you at 10 miles per hour, well, you on the ground, you're going to say the ball was going 500 miles per hour before I even threw it. I threw it at 10, you're going to say it's going 510 miles per hour. That's pretty clear. But Einstein's saying it's not that way for light. If I've got a flashlight beam, I'll see it going the speed of light towards Dan, and you'll see it going the exact same speed of light no matter how fast my airplane is going. And that's such a bizarre idea that the natural thing to ask is why would Einstein say such a strange thing? And the answer, well, the first answer is that it turned out it solved all these problems that he was trying to solve with Maxwell's equations, with some of the paradoxes he encountered in thinking about riding on a beam of light. But in physics, in science in general, just because something sounds like a good idea doesn't make it correct. You need evidence. And so what we need is experimental evidence that the speed of light is really the same for everyone. And interestingly enough, when Einstein published a theory, we already had that. Because in 1887, a very famous experiment was done, the Michelson-Morley experiment, in which they tried to me measure what they thought would be the effects on light from Earth's motion around the sun, and they didn't find any effects at all. They thought nature was playing tricks on them. Einstein basically said, no, that's just nature showing you what nature is, that the speed of light is actually the same for everyone. And nowadays, we can measure it tested in the laboratory in many different ways. You can test that the speed of light is always the same regardless of motion. But my favorite test is one that's a little less obvious, although it stares us in the face. I think you had them on the screen earlier tonight. All those beautiful f pictures you see from the Hubble Space Telescope and other telescopes, you see lots of different stars and lots of different galaxies in those pictures. Each individual star, each individual galaxy is moving relative to us at a different speed. In the pictures from Hubble of distant galaxies, some of those galaxies are moving away from us at speeds approaching the speed of light because of the expansion of the universe. And yet, the light coming into the telescope from every single object is coming in at exactly the same speed. So we know the speed of light really is the same for everyone. And it's from that one idea that you get all the other consequences about space and time and so on. Yeah, one of the examples I really like is taking the, the, um, the, the, the flash torch, flashlight uh, in, in, the, in so, the aircraft and not pointing it this way, but pointing it that way and bouncing it between two mirrors. Yes, and then, we can. And then asking the person on the aircraft and then the person outside the aircraft how far. That's right, and that's how you derive the, you can actually mathematically, using the Pythagorean theorem, get to the equations. Very simple, actually. You, you don't even need calculus, just algebra. Pythagorean theorem, you can get the effects on space and time. But I'll, I'll do my favorite one, um, which is actually your least favorite one. <laughs> What's everybody's least favorite consequence of relativity? I mean, if you've heard about, what, some of you have heard about the consequence of relativity, everybody's least favorite is the one that says you can't go faster than the speed of light, right? Because being human, we don't like being told what we can and cannot do. So you have a natural reaction. If somebody says to you, Dan, you cannot go faster than the speed of light, your natural reaction is, yeah, watch me. Um, <laughs> Again. <laughs> <laughs> and admittedly, given how fast it is, it's not something we're likely to be able to test now. Um, so here's, here's the thought experiment that we'll do to understand why this consequence is, is real. So I want you to imagine that it's sometime in the distant future when we have this incredible technology, and I've built the most incredible spaceship that you could ever imagine. Okay, I'm not limiting its speed. I'm just telling you, it's whatever you, speed you want it to be, we're just going to see what that is. It can go so fast you can't really even conceive of how fast my spaceship can go, and off I go. So what do we know about this? Well, we know it's got to be somewhere up around the speed of light. We haven't said less or more yet, but it's got to be somewhere up there, which means, you know, I don't want to do it in here because I'd hit the wall in a nanosecond. I don't even want to do it on Earth because the speed of light would actually be, you'd be able to circle the Earth eight times in one second at the speed of light. So you're out in space. And it's, you know, we know some things about space. For example, it's dark out there. And since it's dark in space and you don't want to crash into stuff, you better have headlights on your spaceship so you can see where you're going, right? 
So I'm in my spaceship going so incredibly fast, I got my headlights so I can see where I'm going, which is really awesome. I could also, if I wanted, measure the speed that my headlights are going out in front of me at, and what would I find? Speed of light, 300,000 kilometers per second. Now you're watching me, and I'm going incredibly fast, no doubt about it. But you could also measure the speed of my headlight beams, and what would you find? Same speed of light. And what else do you notice about my headlight beams? Well, they're headlights. They're going out in front of me, right? Which means they're beating me. So if they're going the speed of light, then I'm going less. Okay, that is ironclad. You cannot beat that logic. If the speed of light is the same for everyone, then there is no possible way that anyone can ever be seen to be going faster than the speed of light because you can't outrace your own headlights. It's so ironclad that I know, you know, maybe some of you are familiar with this idea enough already, but there's probably a lot of you in here who are trying to think of ways around the logic right now. But don't bother, because you can't. Trust and, if you, yeah. and if you want proof that you cannot get around this logic, just notice the fact that not even science fiction writers try to do it. <laughs> they'll come up with all sorts of loopholes. They'll send you out of the universe into hyperspace, or they'll warp the entire fabric of space-time with, with warp drive, or send you through a wormhole. But they will never try to make you actually move through space faster than the speed of light, because they know you can't do it. It's true. Yeah. <laughs> and the other, all the other thought experiments, you can get to all the other ideas of relativity just as easily without even doing any of the math. You only use that Pythagorean theorem if you want the equation. If you just want the idea, you can do it all completely conceptually. Yeah. And that's one of the, the beauties of it, I think. And, um, but there is some... So that that's basically covers special relativity, the, the understanding of the absolute speed of light. But that's not telling us about everything that we know in the universe. There's one fundamental component of the universe that is still missing from special, the special theory of relativity, and that is gravity. Gravity. So general relativity, the difference between special relativity and general relativity, I should clarify for those of you who are, might be confused about these terms, we often say the theory of relativity, and in some sense there is one theory of relativity, but Einstein published it in two parts. The first part was called special relativity because it's the special case in which we ignore gravity. And then the second part is the general theory where we add gravity into it. And there was a number of reasons why, it was, why he did it in two parts like that. I mean, for one, it's a lot easier to do special relativity without the gravity. The math is much simpler. But also, there were those problems with the laws of electricity and magnetism, which is what he was really solving with the special theory of relativity. I told you that his, he didn't call it the theory of relativity. His paper on special relativity was actually titled On the Electrodynamics of Moving Bodies. So you can see that it's about the equations of electricity and magnetism and how they're affected by motion. And when he came up with that special theory of relativity because he was dealing with problems that other people were aware of. These problems with Maxwell's equations were well known. If you talk to historians of science, they will generally tell you that if Einstein hadn't come up with the special theory of relativity in June of 1905 when he did it, there were several other physicists who were so close to hitting on the same idea that it's quite likely someone else would have published essentially the same theory the same year, later that same year. So it was a theory whose time had come. When he solved those problems with Maxwell's equations, from the standpoint of most other physicists, great, we're done. But Einstein, remember, he started from what would it be like to see the world on a beam of light, and he understood that there were still some things missing, that, and that in order to resolve those things that were missing, which more directly had to do with acceleration, but he realized in what he called his uh, moment of insight in 1907, that the key to resolving these problems was to recognize that acceleration and gravity are essentially the same thing. It's called the equivalence principle. And so he had to bring gravity into it. It took him a while because mathematically it was much more complex to do. But with general relativity, he brought gravity in. So the uh, result of mass then is uh, what fundamentally drives how we have to describe the universe in terms of uh, general relativity then. That's correct. So in 
special relativity, we already have the idea that space and time become intertwined is what we call space-time. And an important thing to know about this that a lot of people forget is that while space is relative for different observers, different observers at different speeds will measure space differently, distances differently, and measure time differently, if you put them together as the combination, the four-dimensional combination of space-time, everyone gets the same answers. There's only one space-time reality. And now, Einstein, he wanted to have acceleration and gravity be equivalent, but the question was, how do you do that in four-dimensional space-time? And the key, as you alluded to there, had to do with how we interpret gravity. And maybe what I'll do is I'll give you a different thought experiment so that you can kind of see how Einstein would have gotten at this idea, even though this is not exactly how he did it. So imagine that you live a long time ago, and you believe the Earth is flat. And you want to do some science, so you hire a couple explorers, and you say to the first one, you go that way, and you say to the second one, you go that way. Don't come back until you discover something really amazing. So sometime later, your two explorers come back, say, what did you discover? And they said, well, we ran into each other. Now, if you truly believe the Earth is flat, that seems pretty crazy. Right? But we know that because the Earth is curved, if you start out in opposite directions and wrap all the way around, you'll meet on the other side. Right? Very, very simple. The reason they meet is because Earth is curved. Now imagine that you're floating weightlessly out in space somewhere. Okay? You're in your spaceship floating weightlessly, and you send a probe in that direction, and you send another probe in that direction. Okay? Would you be surprised if the two probes ran into each other sometime later? This is a hard one, isn't it? Some people I see looks like they'd be surprised and some people wouldn't be. Um, so the, the correct answer is you should not be surprised if you put it yourself in the right place. Like, for example, imagine that the place you're floating weightlessly is the International Space Station. It's orbiting the Earth, right? If you send one probe out one way and the other the other way, they'll both orbit around the Earth and meet on the other side. Why? Well, the normal answer is because of this mysterious Newtonian force of gravity that mystically acts between the probe and the Earth that know each other are there even though they don't have any brains. But imagine you're Einstein looking at this. Again, he didn't do it this way, but imagine that you know, we brought a young Einstein here and told him these two stories. He would say, wait a minute. You told us that the two people on the Earth met because the Earth is curved. And now you did exactly the same thing with the probes, except for you just raised them off the surface of the Earth a bit, and now you're trying to tell us it's a magical force of gravity. Why don't you just say space is curved? Wouldn't that be easier? And that's basically what relativity does. It tells us that the structure of space-time is curved by gravity. It takes out the mystery of how things know to interact gravitationally by saying that space-time itself is shaped by the masses within it. So you've seen, I'm sure, those rubber sheet analogies where the, you get the bowl-shaped depression around an object like the Earth, and you have the space station there, and it's orbiting around, not because of this magical force of gravity just because that's the local shape of the universe. So the International Space Station is a fabulous place to actually test these, uh, these, the, the, these laws, these, these understanding about the theory. We don't, want, we don't want to misunderstand the word theory, do we? Uh, the, the theory of general relativity. And right now there is uh, Commander Scott Kelly on board of the International Space Station and his twin, Mark Kelly, is on the ground and many people have heard of something called the Twins Paradox. So this is an excellent segue, don't you think, ladies <laughs> and gentlemen, to, to perhaps discuss a little bit about what uh, the brother in orbit is experiencing compared to the brother on the ground. Well, as far as he's concerned, everything's perfectly normal, right? One of the things to remember is when we say that time runs slow for an observer moving by you at high speed, that's what you notice about the person moving by you. The person moving by you thinks time's perfectly normal. In fact, they'd say that yours is the time that's, go that's slowed down in the case of special relativity. In the case of general relativity, we'll actually agree on the um, effects of different altitudes. But time is running differently 
but very, very slightly on the space station than it is on the ground. I don't think we're going to be able to measure it for the Kelly brothers. It's, it's too small to notice. But there's even a better example, as you know of this, that you can test for yourself. Well, you'd have to do some software programming. Um, but if you could go into your GPS device and change the software so that it left out relativity, and then see if you can find your way any place. Why? Because the GPS satellites are up a few thousand kilometers above the Earth. That means, because according to general relativity, and we didn't talk about exactly why, but again, you can do a simple thought experiment to get to it. You can read about it in the book later if you want, but we won't go through it here now. <laughs> um, time actually runs slower in stronger gravity than it does in weaker gravity, which is why time runs slower on the sun than it does on Earth, and it runs slower on a white dwarf star than it does on the sun, and so on. And so gravity on the ground here is stronger than it is a few thousand kilometers up. Not by much, but a little bit. And as a result, time actually runs a little bit differently for those satellites up there in the GPS orbit. In addition, they're moving relatively fast, so you also get a correction from special relativity for their motion. But the bottom line is, time runs different for GPS satellites where they are than it does here. And your GPS devices do those calculations for you, including the relativistic time corrections. And if they didn't, you would truly be lost. You wouldn't get anywhere near where you want to get. So we have clear, direct evidence that this is really happening um, in your pockets if you've got a navigation right, yeah, cell phone. Yeah. So um, that kind of deals with how um, regular objects move through the universe, but what about light itself? What is the con consequence of light itself moving through a curved, curved space-time? So when you have, light is going to follow the straightest possible path through the universe. So if the universe is curved, then the light path is going to curve also. And those beautiful pictures you were seeing from Hubble earlier with all those strange shapes and so on, what we call gravitational lensing, is because light is being bent by the structure of the universe. We can actually map out the shape of the universe by following how light is being bent. In fact, you've probably heard of dark matter, matter that we know is out there from its gravitational effects, but we can't detect directly because it doesn't give off any light. But even though we can't see it, we can actually map where it is by looking at those gravitational lens photos and saying, aha, what would the mass distribution have to be in order to make those particular patterns that we see? You use the equations of general relativity to go from what you see back to what mass must be there. And that's one of the ways we know not only how much dark matter there is, but where it is. And there were, there were several um, examples that always caught my attention. One, one is this, the smiley face galaxy. That's, that's a real picture. Those of you that saw it, it's actually a, a real smiley face uh, in space as a result of um, general relativity and the, the distortion of space-time and the, the, the light following the, the curved paths. Another one that, that really caught my attention when I first saw it was the multiply-lensed supernova. Um, and there was also a picture of that. And one of the very interesting predictions that's coming from that is because path are following different, uh, because light is following different paths, there's going to be different, it's going to take a different amount of time for that light to reach us. So what, what is one of the consequences of that then? I mean, that, this sounds like an, an awesome well, event that we're it's a, it's a prediction that yeah. you can actually check out and wait to see if that light arrives as scheduled. And I suspect it will. Um, but there's so much evidence for relativity that if it doesn't arrive exactly on schedule, it'll just tell us we made a mistake in that calculation in terms of how long its path was, and we'll have to go back and see where that error was. Uh, it's also worth noting here that Einstein is very, very famous. And you might wonder, how did he become the iconic you know, scientist of of time, of our, of our time? It's not only because he did such incredible work, but you know, you have to be... Uh, as Donald Trump will tell you, you have to be a media genius also, right, to get all that press time. Um, luckily, Einstein didn't say anything like those things that are being said today. But, um, <laughs> but he did say something really quite extraordinary in his theory. He said that the light would bend along these paths. And people figured out that that would mean that not only, you know, in the f distant future from his standpoint, we're going to get these beautiful Hubble photos, but at that time, light should be bent as it passes by the sun, starlight. 
Now, of course, it's very difficult to see stars in the daytime to see if their light is bent, except for during a total eclipse. And so scientists realized that they could test Einstein's prediction about the bending of space-time by looking at stars during a total solar eclipse. And in 1919, there were two expeditions that set out to do that. They succeeded. The New York Times made it, I think, front-page news, and that was when Einstein became famous. Now, there's, a, there's an eclipse coming up in the continental United States, of course. So this is probably worth priming everybody about now because hotel rooms are going to be very Yes, it is. Now, don't get confused. There's an eclipse coming up on Sunday, which is oh, a wow. total <laughs> lunar <laughs> eclipse, and definitely worth watching. The, my favorite part about Sunday's lunar eclipse is that it occurs before it's my bedtime. Yeah. <laughs> Handy. I don't have to get up in the middle of the night to watch this one. So watch this one on Sunday night. But yes, I believe it's August 21st, 2017, will be the first total solar eclipse to cross the continental United States. The path starts up somewhere up in Oregon, Washington, comes across the United States, goes right through Grand Teton National Park, which is a great spot to watch it from if you want to go there, um, but goes all the way across the United States and out through Charleston, South Carolina. So, uh, yeah, book your rooms before they fill up, and yeah. don't, don't miss this. It's less than two years away, right? It'll probably be the first week of classes. <laughs> <laughs> well, I'll talk to some people. We'll see what we can Yeah. Um, so there's, there's also another famous consequence of uh, general relativity, and that is the black hole. So I'm, I'm sure I, I heard a quiet murmur through the audience. <laughs> Bachelor took 40 minutes to get to black holes. <laughs> well, now we're here. So let's, let's do this. Black, black, I, I'm, black now hole. I really appreciate these chairs. It's yeah. Like, yeah, yeah, we're falling into one. Yeah. Um, <laughs> <laughs> yeah, you know, black holes are, are everybody's kind of favorite thing about relativity. A lot of people don't even realize that they come from relativity, but they do. And it's basically the idea that if you bend space-time, you might bend it so much that you reach a point of, of essentially no return, where not even light can ever get back out of it. And they were actually, the, the mathematics of them was first worked out just a few months after Einstein published his theory by Carl Schwarzschild. And, um, took a long time before we realized that these things actually exist, but now we're very confident that black holes really do exist. Stars at the end of their lives, very massive stars, can leave behind a black hole after a supernova. And in the center of virtually every galaxy, we find some sort of very massive or supermassive black hole. So they say. So they say. <laughs> I, I wouldn't know any of that. Any <laughs> um, his research area, if you don't know that. <laughs> so um, people freak out about black holes. Uh, so what would be perhaps uh, one of the consequences of there being, say, a 10 solar mass black hole somewhere at the edge of our solar system? Bad. Uh, if there were a 10 solar mass black hole near the edge of our solar system, since that's 10 times the mass of the sun, we'd be orbiting it instead of the sun. And the competing gravitational effects of those two would probably throw us out of our orbit completely somewhere. So that, that would be something we would not like. The good news is we don't have to worry about it, because if there was a 10 solar mass black hole anywhere around here, we would know we'd have seen its gravitational effects on things in our solar system already, and so there isn't one. So don't worry about it. Um, the, the thing that people get more concerned about with black holes is getting sucked into them. And don't worry about that either. <laughs> I'll give you two reasons not to worry about one. Uh, the first reason is that, that as, as I like to say, and if you read my book, you'll see this heavily emphasized right in the very, very first page of the book, um, much to a lot of kindergartner and first graders' chagrin, black holes actually don't suck. <laughs> They're just gravity, okay? If you want 
to go into a black hole, you have to dive into it. You have to aim yourself at it and fall in. If you're just going by, you're just going to go on by. You know, it's gravity will make you orbit or sling you out on a parabolic or hyperbolic orbit. It's not going to suck you in like a cosmic vacuum cleaner. That doesn't happen. So the only way that a black hole will hurt you is if you aim for it. And if you want to go aim for a black hole, it turns out that they're kind of about the hardest thing in the universe to fall into by accident. And the reason is because physically in size, right, they're very, very small. They're a, a black hole of 10 solar masses is only a couple of miles across in terms of its, what you perceive from the outside. So that's way smaller than an asteroid. Most asteroids are comets. It's much smaller than Pluto. So if you want to hit an asteroid or a comet or Pluto, you've got to aim really carefully. If you want to hit a black hole, you've got to aim even more carefully. So there's no way that you ever need to worry about falling into a black hole by accident. So that's, that's good news. Um, yeah, so you're either being very careless. Yes. Or you're doing it on purpose. <laughs> or you're doing it on purpose. Now, if you're Matthew McConaughey playing Cooper, is that his name? And Interstellar. How many people saw Interstellar? Okay. Highly, highly recommend you see the movie. It's got a lot of cool stuff about relativity in it. And you know, in that movie, the only mistake they make in that movie, by the, so, well, the I only. shouldn't say the only, <laughs> right. But in terms of the relativity and the black hole sucking, they, they do a nice job of this, right? They, this is not a major spoiler if you haven't seen it, but they go to this supermassive black hole in another galaxy, and what do they find there? They find planets, and what are the planets doing? They're orbiting the black hole. They're not getting sucked in. They've done it correctly. Their spaceship orbits the black hole. They do it correctly. And the only minor mistake with respect to this part that they make is when Matthew McConaughey goes diving into the black hole, one of the crew members says something like, oh, he's getting sucked into it. It's like, no, you know, he's not getting sucked into it. If you're paddling your canoe down a river, and there's a waterfall ahead of you, and you go, oh, cool, and you paddle even harder and go over the waterfall, don't say the pool at the bottom sucked you down. It was your own fault. <laughs> Absolutely. <laughs> so... Um, what will they look like then? We know that they're going to mess with light, so these things are not going to look normal. They're not That's going to look, they're not going to look going like to a mess black planet. With light. Yeah. So the light that you're radiating, your headlights from your ship, it's going to do all kinds of weird things around the black hole, and you can find some nice simulations online of what would happen. But the interesting thing is that actually in most cases you wouldn't see the black hole because you see something else that's blocking your view of it. And what that is, is because black holes are strong gravity, stuff orbits in, gas is going to collect around there. It's not getting sucked in, it's orbiting around, but in gas, when this gas is orbiting around in a gravitational field there, there's friction. And friction means that some of those gas particles are going to lose energy and gradually have their orbits decay until they fall into the black hole. So you're going to have material around almost any real black hole circulating around it and getting hot from that friction, and we call those accretion disks, and therefore you're actually going to see radiation from that disk of material around the black hole, X-ray radiation. So we actually see black holes in a sense. We detect them by looking for sources of cosmic X-rays where this material is heating up and falling into them. So if you go toward the black hole, you're not going to be able to see down at the black hole itself because there's all this gas around it in the way. Right, and then I think um, one of the other things that, that's worth bearing in mind is that people, when they are now, now you've got over your sucking, um, there's the other thing that people always remember is the spaghettification. Correct, correct. So tides... It's a real word. So, yes, yeah. it is a real word. Yeah. Um, when you're... You know what tides are. Tides happen because the strength of gravity is different. You know, we have tides on Earth because the pull toward the moon is stronger on one side of the Earth than the other. And the way to think about that is, you know, if somebody's tugging on one end of you hard and the other end of you in the same direction but not quite so hard, that's going to cause you to stretch. You can think of it with a rubber band. Imagine you take a rubber band and you're moving it all in the same direction, but you move one side a little faster, what happens to the rubber band? It stretches, even though it's all going in one direction. So tides tend to stretch things out. And when you have a black hole, say a 10 solar mass black hole, as you made the mistake of diving into it and aiming very carefully, bad move, um, 
what's going to happen is as you get close to that black hole, the tides are actually going to become so strong that there'll be a noticeable difference between the gravity on your feet and the gravity on your head, so you get spaghettified. Uh, very painful death. Uh, you want to avoid it. It turns out that the larger the black hole, the more massive the black hole, the less that tidal force is, because the strength of gravity at the event horizon of the black hole is always the same, but as the black hole gets bigger, that means you've got more room for that tidal force to be spread over, essentially. So you, if you had a black hole of, of hundreds of millions or billions of solar masses, you could actually safely cross the event horizon. And that is why, in the movie Interstellar, that's why they took the wormhole to another galaxy to find a supermassive black hole, because Kip Thorne, the executive producer of the movie, who's a Caltech physicist and expert in general relativity, said you can't have him dive into an ordinary black hole, he'd be spaghettified. You have to have him dive into a supermassive black hole. And then, you know, the only problem is what happens when you get in there. Um, but we, if you've seen the movie, you know the answer is you'll run into a bookcase. <laughs> right. Full of, <laughs> full of what is relative. <laughs> so um, this brings up a question that was actually posed um, by our cunningly crafted hashtag for, for this event. What, what actually happens to the black hole itself when light or, or mass falls, falls into it? It gains mass. So the black hole, its mass increases. Now, there's a lot of... When you get into the details of what happens to a black hole, what's in the event horizon, what, what would be inside, there, there's a couple of ways to think about that question. One way is, you know, now you're dealing with some pretty esoteric physics where you've got to bring quantum mechanics in and all kinds of other stuff that we don't fully understand. This is why Stephen Hawking works on these kinds of issues, because if you want a theory of everything, right, that's how the movie got its name, that brings quantum mechanics and relativity together, you have to look at these places that we don't fully understand. You know, this, I hope this won't sound like too much of a cop-out, but from my point of view, the problem is once you cross the event horizon, no information gets out from in there. And that means that, at least as far as we know today, there's not even any way in principle that we could actually measure or observe what happens inside the event horizon. So I kind of start to wonder, you know, is this just idle speculation or could we actually get testable predictions here since there's no way we can actually look in there? But certainly the mass of the black hole will increase, its gravity will increase if you dump more mass into it. And that, that, that's the same whether you dump energy into the black hole as well because mass is... Because E equals mc squared, right? So energy when it's concentrated enough, also has gravity and acts like mass, so it adds to the black hole's mass, correct? Right, so no matter what you're firing at the black hole, people or photons, uh, it, it's, going to increase, it's going to increase its mass, which means its radius is going to, That's to right. increase very slightly. But uh, we also heard that time is distorted as you approach this event horizon as well, so really does stuff get to the event horizon? Ah. So, remember what we talked about before with people moving relative to each other. You always think time is perfectly normal. It's other people watching you who will see something different. So if you are outside the black hole in your spaceship and you're watching Matthew McConaughey dive in, what you will find is that as he approaches the black hole, his time runs slower and slower and slower, and at the event horizon, time comes to a stop, which means he will never actually get to the event horizon. So from our point of view, he never enters the black hole. He never gets there. Now, that said, he will still disappear from view. And the reason he will disappear is because his light also becomes more and more redshifted due to the slowing of time, so that as he gets closer and closer to the event horizon, his light becomes so redshifted that no conceivable telescope could ever detect it, so he will disappear. So when matter is falling into a black hole, from our standpoint in the outside universe, technically it never actually finishes falling in. Now from Matthew McConaughey's viewpoint, 
or from the matter falling into the black hole's viewpoint, for it or him, time is running perfectly normal. He's got this big, strong gravitational field that he's falling into. That's a very high acceleration of gravity. So for us, it takes forever. For him, it's like, boom, a couple seconds, I'm in there looking for bookcases. <laughs> That's where they always like the, it's like where all the biros go to in the Hitchhiker's Guide. <laughs> yeah. um, so if he were to turn around as he was falling into the black hole, he would have an awesome sight to see, would, would he not? He would. He would see time running fast when he looks back up at us. But before you think you can use this to, uh, you know, see the future of the stock market and bet on it, remember two things. Number one, even if you could, you're falling into the black hole, you ain't coming back out. So too late to buy anything. And, and number two, that light, for the same reason his light is red shifted to us, that light that he looks back at is going to be very highly blue shifted. So he's probably not going to get any meaningful information from it anyway. If he were, to, if he were able to get some information, though, he would, he would actually witness the evolution of the universe as he fell towards the black hole because of the, the, the time. So he would actually watch our galaxy collide with the Andromeda galaxy. And in, in principle, but I think that from my discussions when I wrote the book about this point with some experts, um, the reality is because of that blue shifting of the light, there's not even really a way that you could get any meaningful information. So, so you really won't see much of the future, unfortunately. It would be fun, but um, now, um, when well, I, you'd still be in the black hole. So, when I, was, uh, when I was a lot younger, one of the first books I read on this was Kip Thorne's uh, Black Holes and Time Warps. Books. Wonderful book. And I think, it, I think it was in his book where he mentioned, well, you don't have to worry about falling into a black hole, not from the you were incredibly careless point of view, but from the fact that humans are going to evolve their technology so fast that by the time you get close to the event horizon, somebody will have invented something that could actually get you back out again. And I, <laughs> I, en I enjoyed reading that. That, that could be. Yeah. It could be. Yeah, if so. Kip Thorne says it, I'm not yeah. going to argue. You know? <laughs> well, maybe I'm, maybe I'm mis <laughs> misattributing it. But. So, um, yeah, there's some, also some uh, other misconceptions bringing this full circle to where we started. There are some common misconceptions about black holes themselves, particularly with being able to, what that ring is that you see around, around these simulations that we saw of black holes, um, and what the event horizon actually is. Rather, just, it's not a spaceship yet. Right. <laughs> right. With the event horizon, you know, we give it this name, but there's nothing there. Seriously, I mean, there's nothing there. It's just a place where the speed of light, where, where light can't get out anymore once you pass that point. But if you're falling into it, you won't see any special thing happen. There's no, no obvious thing that you cross that tells you you just crossed the event horizon. It's basically a mathematical construct of where that boundary is from which we can get information out. Yeah. And not only do you see light coming from behind the black hole, but you could also see some of the light that was going towards that black hole as it actually went full circle. That's right. Yeah. That's right. That's why those simulations are so fun to look at, because you get all kinds of weird stuff, depending on the orientation. And that's why we get so many different variations from smiley galaxies to you know, four around with a fifth maybe to come here. Yeah. Um, you get so many different variations, because slight shifts in the distribution of the mass and the angle that the light is going will produce very different effects, almost like kaleidoscopes, you know? Right, yeah. Cosmic kaleidoscopes, we like that. So, the very end of your book, you have a, a very um, nice justification for why everybody should actually care about relativity beyond the fact that it really sparks very interesting conversations. So, what are your thoughts on actually um, the, the, the value of relativity in terms of uh, everyday life here on Earth? So, I do think that relativity has much deeper value than we give credit for, and that's why it really bothers me that we don't teach it starting in about third grade, because we should. Uh, in the same way that we teach kids in third grade that the world is made of atoms and we don't expect them to know quantum mechanics yet, we can teach them that space and time and gravity are maybe not what you thought, even though we're not going to teach them how to do the details of general relativity yet. 
And, and I, there's four reasons that I think we should be doing this, and we've kind of touched on some of them already, but the first one is just the science. Relativity is our modern understanding of space, time, and gravity. And space, time, and gravity is kind of everything there is. So if you want to know about everything there is, you need to know relativity. Um, second reason is what I like to think of as your perception of reality. We would like to all believe that we have some understanding of what reality is. And so the example I'll give you is, you know, imagine that you're out somewhere and you meet somebody and, and they tell you that they are totally convinced and deeply believe that Earth is the center of the universe. Okay, but you'd probably feel a little bit sorry for them, right? Because for 400 years now, we've known that Earth is not the center of the universe. So if you still believe that Earth is the center of the universe 400 years after we learned it's not, you don't have a real grasp of reality as we understand it today. But in the same way, for a hundred years now, we've known that space and time are not what you ordinarily think they are. Isn't that the same kind of distortion of reality? So if you want to have an understanding of reality as we understand it today, you need to know something about relativity. My third reason why I think everyone knows, needs to know something about this is because I think relativity tells us an important story about human potential. And I won't go into too much detail on this, other than to say, if you look at Einstein's own life, he lived through really terrible times, World War I, World War II, the Holocaust, the Armenian Genocide. Bad things happened, and yet he was always this incredible optimist about the future of the human race. And I think one of the reasons was because he himself had seen the power of the human mind to discover amazing things. And he knew that if we can just all teach ourselves to use our brain power wisely instead of unwisely, we have a fantastic future ahead. And so knowing what we can do, knowing about relativity, shows what human potential is. And my fourth reason is the most philosophical, so it's the most fun, but I have to explain it a little bit. So remember I told you that space and time can be measured differently, but there's only one space-time reality. So I want you to imagine not you personally, but maybe, maybe somebody in the audience, not you, but whoever's sitting next to you. Um, <laughs> you know, you're probably, they're probably nice people today, but maybe in first or second grade or something, they had a mean streak going, right? And one day, that person sitting next to you, you know, back in first or second grade, another kid was sitting next to them and was kind of bugging you a bit, right? So you just whack, you hit them, okay? Now, the kid screams, next to you. I guess I turned it into you hitting him. Sorry. Um, I, we all had these little moments or something. Um, the kid screams. The teacher says, what's going on? You know, you put up your hands. You say, I have no idea. I didn't do anything. And, and the teacher doesn't know what's going on, so you got away with it. Now, in space-time, space-time means the four dimensions, the combination of space and time, where you can move through time as well as through Space, so a, a place in space-time is an event, a moment in time and space. So if there are four-dimensional beings that can move through all four dimensions of space-time in the same way that we can move through the three dimensions of space, then at, in principle, at any moment, I, and don't ask me what a moment means to a four-dimensional being, I'm not sure, but just go with it. At any moment, that four-dimensional being could be wandering around through space-time, and they're looking over here, and oh, that's you in first grade right there. And what do they see? Whack. So you got caught. You didn't get away with it, you got caught. Because it is there, it is a moment, it is an event in space-time. Once it's there, it's, it's part of the space-time reality. Back in school when they told you, you be careful what you do because it'll go on your permanent record, <laughs> it, it's actually true. You have a permanent record in space-time. Everything you do in your life, everything you do throughout your entire existence is an event in space-time that in principle a four-dimensional being could go look at at any moment. If you want to understand this idea in a little in a few other ways, I highly recommend you um, read Kurt Vonnegut's novel, Slaughterhouse-Five, where he talks about this idea in some depth. And, going back to our movie Interstellar, that's what the bookcase is. 
right? It's the moments in both space and time that he's moving around through. Again, not a major spoiler if you haven't seen it yet. Go see it anyway. Um, but so you are leaving. Every act you do in your life leaves a little mark on space-time. And if you think about that, you know, that might make you go, gosh, I wish that when four-dimensional beings go look at my mark on space-time, I didn't do anything that will embarrass me. I didn't do anything that I'll regret that someone can see. So I think that if everybody understood these ideas of relativity, we might actually all be a little bit nicer to each other because we want to make sure that we were proud of the mark that we left on space-time. And I think that there is a good reason for every human being to learn something about the theory of relativity. Absolutely. The book, moderately priced book, is available in the lobby, uh, What is Relativity, uh, and also available in all fine bookstores throughout the nation, no doubt, and online and Amazon. Um, They'll order it for you anyway. They might not carry it. But. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Uh, so believe it or not, uh, we have run out of time. Um, but we still have the opportunity for you all to ask some questions. We have microphones uh, down the front here on either side of the aisle. Um, so whilst you guys are figuring out what it is you would like to ask, uh, we can fill in the time by, by going to some of the questions that have been asked on Twitter. I haven't checked in the last hour, so if you've done them in the last hour, then I actually suggest you get out of your seat. Uh, but some of the questions that were submitted are excellent, and I think we'd like, I'd like to start off with a, with a question that was asked about, um, I think it was uh, user Elijah. He asked, uh, what are your thoughts? What are your thoughts on man-made gravity in space? Man-made gravity in space. Um, I guess, unfortunately, I have to answer that. I don't really have any thoughts on that because I don't know how we would do it, and I don't know if anyone's thought well, of a way to do it. There would be, the typical way is to have a centrifuge, I would presume. Right? So you have a, a large rotating 2001 Space Odyssey Oh, spacecraft. So if we're talking so man-made gravity, artificial gravity, you could artificial gravity of a rotating spaceship. Yes. Yeah, yeah. Um, well, those are great because then you can go on long space trips without having your bones decay right. the way it happens to the uh, astronauts on the space station. Now yeah, they would yeah. love that. Right. Um, so yeah, that's in principle very doable if you build a large enough spaceship. Right, yeah. But it, it, I mean, so part of the ongoing experimentations on board the International Space Station are to do with these things, whether or not you can mitigate muscle loss and bone loss um, and not have to actually have one of these huge rotating spacecraft, because obviously they're, they're, these things are ginormous. If you were to be on one of these rotating things, it'd have to be hundreds of meters across, rotating once every five, six seconds or something like that. It's a little slower than that, but yeah. 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 But you'd look out the port... 20 seconds or what, yeah. You'd look out the porthole and your entire view of the Earth would be... Yes. <laughs> create, it create its own issue. And you're already weightless uh, and struggling to keep your lunch down and that just wouldn't, wouldn't be... Uh... Well, if you're, but if you're in there, then you're not weightless anymore once you're in oh, that uh, yeah, rotating of course. thing, right? Yeah, so, yeah. 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 <laughs> All right, so we've got people waiting. Ladies first, I... Thanks for the great talk, Jeff. Um, NASA's been talking about doing that rotating spacecraft for decades. I hope we finally get a chance to do it at some time. That'd be awesome. My question had to do actually with um, black holes and relativity. I don't know if you saw in the news about a month or two ago, Stephen Hawking put out a new theory about black holes. And personally, I don't understand what he's talking about. So I'm wondering if you do. I, I read something to do. I didn't see a paper on it. It's just a talk that he gave that he mentioned something to do with the information doesn't actually fall into the black hole. It stays in the event horizon. I'm wondering if you have any insight you've seen more information in the past month or two about this. Um, unfortunately, I, this is an area that I'm not very familiar with either, but what Hawking did back in the 70s um, was, was he realized that you could analyze information quantum mechanically and what, what has to happen to information you know, using principles of entropy and so on. And um, what, I, what I can't answer is why he's changed his mind on 
some of these things recently. I, that's an area of the mathematics and physics that I'm not well enough first in to comment on. Maybe. Th well, he would change his mind because he's presented with new evidence, of course. <laughs> Correct, of course, right, yes. Right. This yes. is the way these things work. <laughs> I mean, there's plenty of jokes you can make about this. You've probably heard that uh, black holes have no hair, right? So, so I, can, I can now make comparisons to some of my illustrious colleagues, uh, <laughs> which one is most like a black hole. So, yeah, we, so to, <laughs> in more ways than one. <laughs> Moving swiftly on. Um, yes, uh, no, the, 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 the standard thought is all information is lost in a black hole, and the, uh, the only way that you would know that some information has entered the black hole is by observing the, the change in the radius or the, or the or entropy of the black hole itself. Well, you, you, can, you can actually measure the entropy of a black hole just by looking at the, the surface area of the black hole itself. Yeah. But um, apparently somebody had already thought of what Hawking had presented a couple of months before that. So that, that's, what, that's my <laughs> understanding. That's as far as I went before I went, I, I, I'm either going to get confused or I don't have time for this. <laughs> yeah. All right, we have another question. Uh, now you have to excuse me if I sound uh, ignorant as I go through this, but um, I wanted to ask, I wanted to pose a question of, do you think... I mean, you're, you're talking about how all these ideas, this idea of relativity, is something you have to have a completely different sort of common sense for. Something that we can't really use our common frame of reference to um, compare by. Um, and so I was wondering if, because of this, because we've gotten to the point where our understanding of the universe is so, is so almost, almost abstract, so completely out of what we understand, do you think at this point we've started to get to a point, um, I'm sorry, I'm being a little circ circular about my question. Um, really what I'm saying is, do you think that at some point in the future we could ever discover something that made our way of looking at all this completely wrong? I mean, I look at the, look at the, 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 the idea of Aristotle, uh, the, like back in the times when they thought the universe was made of 12 elements. And as we test it, hey, that's true. And so um, coming up to today of, oh, well, we have, these, we have these mentions of space and time. We test them, they're true. But do you think that something like that could happen again, that we have some big revelation that changes all this? So, yes and no. There can certainly be big revelations that will change our view of things in the universe. But I think one of the important things to worry, and, and you mentioned it briefly with the word theory, uh, one of the important things to keep in mind is that when we use the word theory in science, and even scientists often use it incorrectly, but when we use it correctly, a theory is supposed to mean something that has been incredibly well tested and verified to high precision over and over and over again. And that means that that evidence, I mean, you checked it, it checked out, that can't go away. And that means it can't be wrong. What you might discover is that there's areas where your theory doesn't apply. And the great example of this is going back to Newton's theory of gravity. Newton had a theory of gravity before Einstein did. And Newton's theory of gravity works really, really well in almost all circumstances, and certainly all the circumstances that were known back at that time. But it turns out when gravity becomes extremely strong, to a point where Newton couldn't even know that gravity could ever be that strong, when it becomes extremely strong, um, the theory, Newton's theory of gravity doesn't work in those regimes so well. So basically, Newton's theory of gravity is still correct. It's just not the entire story of gravity. It's correct in this realm of, you know, gravitational strengths. To go broader, you need Einstein's theory of gravity. Where you get the viewpoint change is that Einstein's theory of gravity gave us a different way of thinking about gravity. Instead of being this kind of magical force at a distance, it gave us a way to think of it in terms of curvature of space-time. So Einstein's theory will never be shown to be wrong. It's correct. It's been too well tested. But it could be that when we have a later theory of gravity, which we almost certainly will someday, since we know that there's problems between gravity and quantum mechanics that need to be resolved, maybe it'll change our interpretation of how we think about gravity. That is something we can't rule out. Thank you. Yeah. So yeah, it, it wouldn't be it wouldn't be that general relativity was wrong. It's just that an improvement would be made to then uh, explain even further That's some right. of the it things. That's right. It was not still... the whole story. It right. was part of the story, but not the whole story. Because you can you can quite easily derive the Schwarzschild radius very well using the Newtonian approximation. That's it's a very right. straightforward to do, thing to do. Yeah. Yeah. Yep. All right, young sir. Thanks, this is a great talk. Just a quick question I never really understood. 
I always read that uh, black holes have uh, X-ray jets coming out the top and bottom. How does that happen and why? Um, so it's, again, it's, it's that disk of material that's circulating around them. And people don't understand exactly why you get the, the two jets, but they're not coming out of the black hole itself. They're coming from that disk of material that's swirling around it. And somehow, between the, the pressure in the disk and the magnetic fields, you get these polar flows. And polar flows like that are actually very common um, throughout the universe, not only when you have material circulating around a black hole. And in all cases, they're not yet fully understood. But even young stars, when they're forming, often have jets going out in, in opposite directions. So whatever that mechanism is that does it in other cases, um, it's, it's the same idea. Not from the black hole itself, but from the material around it. And these jets are a multi-wavelength phenomena. They, just, they, they don't just happen at one wavelength, and there's multiple reasons for that, including applying the principles of general relativity and special relativity itself. It's, these things are moving at appreciable fractions of the speed of light, these jets. So you have to apply special relativity to understand the emission that you are seeing from these jets. But the, the question of jets itself is an active area of research, and when when physicists say active area of research, what we mean is, I need a PhD student. <laughs> <laughs> so if and you're volunteering. So, right, and so uh, w when you see a physicist waving their hand like this, it means that there's a, probably a Nobel Prize somewhere. We definitely need, we definitely need good PhD phys for physics students. Um, but yeah, there, there is something that goes on. There's some interaction between the matter that's being accreted onto the black holes, not only the, the solar mass black holes, but the supermassive black holes themselves. Somebody waves their hands and you get jets. So you tell us in 10 years what it is that's producing these jets. Uh, you can come up here and tell us all about it. All right. All right. Yes, sir. Appreciate it. Um, appreciate it. Thank you for coming, first of all, and uh, great talk. Um, so earlier, very early on in, in your lecture, you we covered that astronauts in the space station aren't weightless because there's no gravity, that they're weightless because of free fall. Is there ever a place in the universe that we know of that is so far away from a gravitational source that there legitimately is no gravitational effect, and in that situation, do you just kind of stay put, or, or, I, without rambling, I think you get it, right? So. Yeah, yeah, yeah. 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 Um, so I, I don't think there would ever be a place where there would be no structure to space-time at all, which is what you're really talking about with gravity. But but if there was, you would still be weightless. So. Um, Free fall is kind of still a non-relativistic interpretation of what's going on. So in relativity, and, and this might get a little technical here if you haven't uh, studied it or if you haven't read my book yet, because it's explained in the book, but um, you are weightless, according to relativity, you're weightless when you are following the straightest possible path through space-time. And when you're deviating from that straightest possible path, it means there's something affecting you that's forcing you off that path, and therefore you feel a force, and that force gives you weight. So uh, that's basically the answer, is as long as you're on the straightest possible path through space-time, and if there was no gravity, you'd be in a completely flat area of space-time, your straightest possible path would be straight. But when you're coming by Earth, that straightest possible path will be an orbit of some sort. Thanks. And it's, it's important to bear in mind that there's more than one gravitational object in the universe. For example, we have to consider how space-time is distorted in cis-lunar space, the, the space between the Earth and the Moon, because the, the Moon has gravity as well as the Earth, and there is some point, in fact, there are several points, where you can take the effects of the gravity from either body and they can cancel each other out. And it, these places are very interesting for orbital dynamicists because you can put stuff there or you can orbit stuff around that point. And this is one of these points um, is actually where we're going to be sending the James Webb Space Telescope in, in, in October of 2018. It's to one of those, those places that you, that you mentioned. So they, these are called Lagrangian points if you want to Wikipedia it. Forgive, forgive me, Lagrangian 
Lagrangian. Lagrangian, yeah. Thank you so much. No problem. Yeah. All right, who's up next? Hello, sir. Thank you for coming out tonight. I have a question about the theory of everything. So, the theory of relativity seems to paint the universe as very deterministic. For example, if a fourth dimensional creature was to look at um, the, the vector of time, they, they would see us before uh, our past and our future, even events that, from our perspective, haven't happened yet. And then there's um, another prevailing physics theory, quantum mechanics, which paints a very different story. It's a, a very chaotic, completely random. So if um, you were to unify everything, these two conflicting theories that don't seem to get along together, could you unify them so that they supplement each other instead of seemingly conflicting with each other? And if so, would the theory of everything show the universe, in your opinion, to be deterministic or chaotic? <laughs> Oh, excellent question. Well, first of all, if I could unify them, then that'd be really cool because I'd win the Nobel Prize yeah. and become <laughs> really, wave your hand. really, really famous, right? Um, but yes, that is the basic problem. Now, I will caveat that with the question of whether relativis relativity is deterministic is actually still subject to debate among philosophers of science, even aside from quantum mechanics. Certainly the past is fixed in space-time like we talked about. Whether your future would also be fixed, you know, that's a, something that people would still debate. But either way, your, your point is, is valid that, that there has to be some reconciliation of them at some point. And uh, so we don't know which way it will turn out. Um, you know, there's a lot of physicists right now who are sort of leaning towards this stuff that you may have heard called the multiverse where essentially every possible universe exists. So there's another universe where you're standing here and you asked a very slightly different question, um, and so on down the line. Um, you know, I, personally, I'm not a fan of the multiverse. It just seems too ad hoc to me. So I don't like that answer. Could still be true, but I don't like it. Um, I don't really like determinism either. I want to have free will. So, you know, I, I don't know where it'll lead. I just know where I hope it will lead, which is to neither one of those. <laughs> <laughs> so maybe it's worth quickly pointing out why there, why there is an issue between gravity and, and quantum mechanics. As we, as everyone knows that these black holes are things that have got smaller and smaller and smaller and smaller and smaller. And of course, the smaller things become, the more we have to worry about these uh, quantum effects. That's right, and so you know that quantum mechanics is our theory of very small things, and general relativity, in a sense, is our theory of very big things, and, and the problem is that they don't quite meet up in one particular place, which is what we call the singularity of the black hole. So that's the point where, in principle, all the mass would be compressed to. And if you think about it, um, in kind of very simplistic terms, general relativity tells you infinitely dense, you know, infinite mass compressed to zero size is going to be infinite curvature of space-time. But quantum mechanics tells you you can't have a known exact curvature. You have to have space and time fluctuating wildly in that situation. And so they both can't be correct. So since they both can't be correct, it means either one of them's correct and the other one's wrong, or they both are incorrect at that point, and we need a different theory that will somehow bring it all together. But one way or the other, um, they're not meeting happily in the middle, and therefore we need a theory of everything to explain what's really going on. Yeah. And so quite frequently, is it is in your book where you say that gravity always wins? Whose book, whose book is that? There, there is a, I was reading recently a book where it says gravity always wins. Well, right. there's a caveat there. <laughs> yeah. yeah. Uh, and, unless you're right at the center of a black hole. Then Correct. we kind of have to get another PhD student to yep. come in and help us out. Yeah. Oh, look at this growing line over here. Yeah. Great talk, sir. Uh, very informative. and. You sparked a question with me when you brought up your hypothetical four-dimensional being that can move through time and space. So I have a question for you, and forgive me if I'm incorrect in my assumption because my knowledge of physics and science is relatively limited. Um, okay, so if said being could move through any point in time and space, could they see your future because it's time subjective because if we haven't experienced a, an event yet, is it like, for instance, we're only seeing through a small hole, but right. they can see everything? So is our future, in essence, I guess, predetermined, and does anything we do actually right. matter? Right. That, that's very closely related to what we were talking about a moment ago. So okay. that, and that's the point that philosophers will debate even aside from 
quantum mechanics. But if you bring quantum mechanics in, then it suggests that you know, there could be multiple futures um, and you're going to choose one of them. But if you read, and I do highly recommend to everyone reading Kurt Vonnegut's novel Slaughterhouse-Five, which in case the title puts you off, it is not about a slaughterhouse. It's about World War II. Kurt Vonnegut was held prisoner in, for real during World War II in a building called Slaughterhouse Five. That's how the book gets its title. Um, in that book, he basically gives us a deterministic view where the future is set, and these four-dimensional beings think we're so pathetic for believing that we have free will. Um, but I don't think that philosophers are generally agreed on that point. I'm certainly not agreed on that point. I still think we have free will and that the future is not determined. I just don't know why I think that. You have no choice. So. <laughs> <laughs> this, could, this could degenerate quite quickly. We'll, we'll move on. Yeah. Do black holes ever die? Oh. Oh, that's a very, very good question. So according to what Stephen Hawking did in the 1970s with this work on information, uh, black holes must actually radiate. It's kind of a strange type of radiation because it's not the way you would normally think of it. We call it Hawking radiation. And it actually consists of particles appearing outside the black hole. Um, and because they're appearing outside the black hole, that means the black hole must be losing mass to create the mass that's outside it. So still nothing crosses the event horizon. We're not violating things coming out of a black hole. But the black hole actually loses mass in this process. And so if you calculate it out how long it takes for a black hole, this is called a black hole evaporation, um, it depends on the size of the black hole. And one of the interesting calculations that was done back in the 70s was that if you had very small black holes, like a black hole with the mass of the Earth, it would be evaporating around now if it was formed during the Big Bang. And that's the only time you could form a black hole of that mass in principle, because right now there's not enough self-gravity to an object like Earth to form a black hole. But in principle, during the Big Bang, um, something like that could have been you know, pushed into existence. And so people actually looked for that. They looked for Hawking radiation from evaporating black holes and didn't find any. So that kind of tells us that these mini black holes like this don't really exist. But even if you go to maxi black holes, you find that eventually, if the universe were still around long enough, eventually they would evaporate. And so the entire universe would decay into just a subatomic set of subatomic particles. Um, you know, the good news is the decay time for the big black holes is over 10 to the 100th years. And uh, Carl Sagan did a, did a beautiful thing back in his original Cosmos, if you're wondering what 10 to the 100th is like. He said, write, get a piece of paper and write a 1 followed by 10 to the 100th zeros on it. And if you roll that piece of paper up, it won't fit in the universe. So it's an enormous, enormous number. The total number of atoms in the entire universe is only about 10 to the 80th. So we're talking about things in the incredibly distant future. And one of the things I always want to remember, remind people about when you hear about astronomers talking about the future, like the fate of the universe, like right now, the fate of the universe. We know the universe is expanding, and the expansion is actually accelerating, which obviously means that the universe is going to keep expanding and accelerating forever. Unless, between now and forever, we discover something different. <laughs> which is always a possibility. I have a follow-up question. So, uh, is it possible for a black hole to live forever, given that you keep on adding matter to it? Well, so in this long-term picture of the universe, eventually you would run out of matter to add to it, right. and then it would evaporate. So, if Hawking is correct, then the black holes would not last forever. Thank you. All right, moving on. I'm new to all of this, so I might not, it might not be a very good question, but if, on a flat plane of existence, if you could bend space-time down in front of you and then up behind you, could you push yourself faster than the speed of light? You just invented warp drive. <laughs> <laughs> Um, I mean, yes, that's how Star Trek writers justified what 
they were doing. Now, whether that's actually possible, nobody knows. But, you know, in principle, if you figured out a way to do that, you'd have warp drive. So get on that. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. Yeah, you're due to be working in a garage somewhere, if I remember my Star Trek history and, and inventing that. Uh, yeah, Zephyr and Cochran. Um, all right. Uh, we've got time for, I think, the last three people. If, you're, if you've got quick questions, we should, should be able to get through you all. So uh, let's go, yeah, there. Okay. Um, you mentioned the multiverse theory earlier. Uh, is there any evidence supporting it, or is it just a nice thought experiment? There, there is no evidence supporting it. One of the great problems in physics today is that all these great ideas that physicists have are so far untestable. You know, if, if you wonder, what does a theoretical physicist do all day? <laughs> the answer is they keep working these equations in hopes that one of the equations will lead them to a prediction that we can actually test with our current technology. And unfortunately, so far, that hasn't been come up with. So, and string theory and multiverse theory, these are places where we're kind of using the word theory wrong, because we don't actually have any evidence for them. Now, um, mathematicians would say that these are mathematical theories because they're robust mathematically. Um, so they're valid mathematical theories, but whether they correspond to physical reality, we just don't know yet. All right, yeah. Okay, last, last two questions. Thank you very much for uh, coming to, uh, to FIT. My question is, could there exist a place in space-time or in the universe where there is absolutely no matter or energy? And if so, what would that place be like? Well, there certainly is energy everywhere. You're going to find you know, photons, e even there's you know, energy even in the vacuum, if, if we're correct about our interpretations of this acceleration of the cosmos and so on. So I, I don't know how that could be possible, and therefore I don't know what it'd be like either. Um. <laughs> no, e even, when, even when we try and, and think about what would happen if you tried to actually create a volume of space that has absolutely nothing in it, there's still going to be something in it because quantum mechanics. I, I love how vague that answer is, but that's what you're going to have to <laughs> That's what you're going to have to deal with them. <laughs> yeah. All right. Thank you very much. I have a short question. Uh, can space-time be quantized? I, that's your Nobel Prize right there. <laughs> yeah. Um, I mean, that is, that's another way of asking those same questions about how you bring quantum mechanics and relativity together and get that theory of everything. So, so uh, that's what people are seeking to do is, is answer all those kinds of questions that we don't really know right now. There's plenty still to find out. And on that note, please join me in thanking Dr. Bennett again. Thank you very much. <laughs>